Pomona, California is named in honor of the ancient Roman goddess of fruitful abundance. In June 1911, Pomona High School sweethearts Cordelia Hornaday and Walter Knott were married and moved into a new home built by the groom on West 4th Street. Cordelia had arrived from Illinois seven years earlier, along with her father and younger sister. Her mother Martha had died when she was 11, forcing Cordelia to mature quickly and become a homemaker a crucible that would reveal her knack for working with food. Walter also came from a single parent household and quit school early to generate income and support his mother. Whenever Walter wasn't working at one of his many jobs, he and Cordelia took to the nearby hills for picnic dates. Cordy prepared baskets with lemonade, thumbprint cookies, biscuits with jam, and one other thing. After they were married, Walter took a job with a local cement company and Cordy made their home a dandy one. They were doing great in Pomona, but Walter's dream to become a farmer would change all that. In 1914, the Knott family left the comforts of Cordelia's adopted city, never to return. The first stop was an adobe homestead far, far away from any city or village. In the Mojave Desert, Cordelia went without seeing her husband for weeks at a time, as his failed attempts at farming the dry soil required him to take odd jobs elsewhere. Their home had no heating, no indoor running water, and the sand whipped by the desert winds got everywhere and into everything. They endured the harsh conditions as a stipulation of the Desert Land Act of 1877, which guaranteed homesteaders ownership of 160 acres of land after three years of settlement and improvement. Three children and three sand bitten years later, the Knott family was again on the move this time north to Shandon, where Walter arranged for them to become sharecroppers. Unlike the desert, produce grew in abundance, and that freed up time for Cordy to work on a new project, retail. Chocolate dipping is virtually a lost art. Years ago, this was the only way it was done. But when machinery came in, this kind of chocolate dipping went out. You might say it went out with high button shoes. She made fudge and other confections and sold them at a little general store in town. In three years time, she had made enough money to buy the family's first car and with it, the promise of a new California adventure. Buena Park was nothing like Pomona. When the Knotts settled here in 1920s, simple luxuries like indoor plumbing weren't an option. The farming wasn't hot either. They were sharecroppers again in partnership with Walter's cousin, Jim but Cordy knew her husband had aims to own the land one day. They welcomed their fourth child in 1922 and the family was complete. Berry vines eventually yielded fruit and business picked up. When the lease ended in 1927, cousin Jim left the farm and Walter negotiated a rent to own agreement with his landlord, Sam Coffran, for 10 of the 35 acres they had been working. To cover the higher costs of the land payments, not used $10,000 of saving and built a retail complex to attract motorists traveling Highway 39 towards Balboa. The family moved into a new farmhouse with indoor plumbing, confidence was growing, and then... There's an old saying on Wall Street that the two most important emotions are fear and greed. It was another time when Americans thought prosperity would last forever. So many people made so much money in the market, it seemed that you just couldn't go wrong. But it all came crashing down. It was wild panic. Just like chickens with their head cut off, they didn't know which way to run. Following the crash of 1929, crop prices plummeted. Farmers that built up their operations by taking out loans couldn't generate enough revenue to meet their debt obligations, and one by one, family farms buckled. Knott's didn't. By purchasing Coffrin's land for a rent-to-own agreement, Knott created the financial flexibility to afford his payments as well as by 10 additional acres. The trials of the high desert hardened them, and they would not only survive during the Great Depression, they would thrive. The retail complex included a berry market, nursery, and on the north end, a tea room with five tables. From the kitchen of the family home, Cordelia served up simple fare such as sandwiches, hot rolls with jam, and a fresh berry pie. Everyone had to sell something during those depression years in order to make ends meet. As travelers discovered Cordelia's delicious food, lines for the tea room formed. Cordy didn't picture herself a restauranteur and stuck with only five tables, though she did hire on some local women to help with the workload. 
Walter was busy nursing to health the vines of a hybrid berry created by Rudolf Boysen. It's 1934. There are two stories about what happened next. One story tells it that Walter was walking by the berry place and a customer asked him, what's that smell? It's so delicious. To which he replied, oh, that's my wife Cordelia frying chicken for our dinner. When the customer was disappointed to learn it wasn't on the menu, Walter decided to suggest to his wife they give the chicken dinners a try. Cordy wasn't a restaurateur and Walter needed to convince her. The other story goes that Cordelia anxiously watched the bills mount and after some thought realized that selling fried chicken dinners would drum up more business. Then she suggested it to Walter, but he had doubts. You already know how each story ends. Which account is the right one? That's anyone's guess. Either way, the couple had a spat over fried chicken. If that ain't love, I don't know what is. On the evening of June 13th, 1934, Cordelia sold eight fried chicken dinners in the tea room as an experiment. Using her wedding china, Cordelia dished up salad with rhubarb sauce, hot biscuits, veggies, mashed potatoes with gravy, her signature fresh fried chicken, and for dessert, berry pie a la mode. Everything was cooked and clean in the family's farmhouse kitchen. Diners were charged 65 cents each. When I was at SC, I had to sit one day with the house mother at the, her table, breakfast table, and she was saying, oh, I went to Knott's uh, for chicken dinner yesterday, and she said, you know, it's just not the same when those little girls aren't waiting on the tables. And I, I always was sorry that I didn't say, well, we're not waiting on the tables because we want an education too, you know. But I never did say that, and she never did know that she was talking to one of those little girls that she missed. Word about the chicken dinners got out and crowds descended on the farm. By 1935, Cordy's tea room seated 40. By 1936, 70. They were frying up 620 chicken dinners a day and lines were getting longer. Not hard on more local women to help and still the family would rise before dawn to prep chickens, bake pies, braise cabbage and what not. The enterprise outgrew the farmhouse kitchen and Knott's planned to build a larger dining room and commercial cookery. Walter called up his creditors and asked to defer rent payment so that he could fund construction. Where have we heard that before? Wind at their backs, Knott's opened a 225 seat dining room only three years after the eight meal experiment sales rocketed to over 1,700 meals per day. The expansion didn't solve the line problem though. Diners were queuing up to three to four hours for the famous fried chicken. Hoping to distract the patient patrons, Walter trucked in 15 tons of volcanic rock from the Mojave and set up a lush oasis adjacent to the restrooms. It was meant for their loyal guests, but Cordelia found refuge here too. Other amusements were added to occupy the hungry diners as they each waited for the loudspeaker to call their name. It spread very fast. Um, you saw what well, you had in the paper, the picture of the lines that went clear down the street. Um, that success came very quickly. Another expansion in 1939 grew the dining to 600 seats. A revised layout in 1944 pushed it to 700. By 1946, they had served 1 million chicken dinners. In 1950, they were serving a million chicken dinners a year. How was all this possible? Let's go back into the kitchen and find out. Come on along. We're going to take a special tour of some of the places visitors to the farm never get the chance to see. This busy lady is Mrs. Cordelia Nutt. This is her kitchen. She's got a lot of help now, but Mrs. Knott runs her kitchen today just as she did back in 1934. Cordelia was the architect of a chicken dinner assembly line. 
she perfected the system by specializing her team members, and a team of 35 fry cooks, line cooks, bakers, and dishwashers were loath to cut corners. Their day starts early. The knots literally get up with the chicken. Early morning outside the chicken dinner kitchen is always a scene of busy activity. On hand to check off the incoming supplies is a third generation of the Knott family. This is Ken Knott, grandson of Walter and Cordelia. Ken is learning the restaurant business by assuming part of the responsibility of the management of the chicken dinner restaurant and kitchen. It's a big job and he's learning it from the bottom up. Cordy trained her children and grandchildren to marshal a proper kitchen and sent those generations out to open more eateries around the market and ghost town. Last year, in the five dining rooms, they used 1,166,904 napkins and plate settings. 224,000 bags of flour were used, enough to make nearly a half million pies or more than 10 million biscuits. These three ladies represent more than half a century of pie-making experience. Last year, they baked 93,408 pies, and every one of them had that home-cooked taste. Walter sourced new equipment and machinery to help the kitchen keep pace. He once installed a machine that could peel, pulp, and juice a crate of oranges in less than two minutes. How's about that, queen of the citrus bowl? The menu for the chicken dinner is almost the same as it was that first day in 1934. Matter of fact, this is probably the only restaurant in the world that has served rhubarb every day for well over 25 years. Throughout the Midwest, rhubarb is known to a lot of folks as pie plant because rhubarb pie is so popular. But here it's served as an appetizer. Over in the biscuit department, you'll find some ladies who have been right here in Mrs. Knott's kitchen for a good many years. The biscuit cutter being used here is Mama Knott's original utensil, always delivering the same results, never far from its loving owner. The very same individual treatment given to the pies and the biscuits is also accorded every piece of chicken cooked in this kitchen. The chickens are held under refrigeration before cooking for just the proper amount of time to ensure tenderness, flavor, and taste. It is carefully rolled in dough and then fried until it's a mouth-watering golden brown. Even though they serve thousands of chicken dinners a day, all of it is cooked in small batches. This is the way Mrs. Knott has always insisted her dinners be cooked. No plate went to the dining room without meeting the boss's precise requirements. More than anything, Mrs. Knotts wanted her guests to feel like they were enjoying a meal at home. No matter how big the restaurant became, the same generosity and personal touch was presented by the dining room team of 55 waitresses, buses, and hosts. Like many Americans that endured the Great Depression, the Knotts knew that every bit of food had value and therefore nothing was to be wasted. Staff were often sent home with leftovers to feed their families. Unused fruit was frozen and later made into preserves. Raw chicken necks and carcasses were sold to the neighboring alligator farm. Nothing wasted. Back when the tea room offered its first chicken dinner, the Knott family was making payments on 20 acres of land. In less than eight years as restaurateurs, they owned over 120 acres outright. Their success with the boysenberry and other crops were a contributing factor. But for real, it was all about those chicken dinners. Now this is all very historic. We're sitting here under the picture of your mom and dad walking through historic ghost town. And we have your mom's chicken just been delivered to us. And you've already given me instructions right. on how to eat it and what to eat first. What'd you say? Well, if it were me, I would start with the wishbone and then the thigh and then the leg. And the one instruction I have to give you is that you must eat it with your fingers. There is no other way to eat the chicken. Well, except I'm with originally your from Tennessee, so you don't have to tell me that. <laughs> okay. But I want you to notice this. Look, the two sisters are cheating. You all are having salads. Well, we have eaten an awful lot of chicken in our days. <laughs> Knott's retail products graced the shelves of grocery stores around the Southland. Mail orders were shipped far and wide. Never one to cut her employees slack, Cordy was as generous as she could be strict. 
She was known to give her staff flexible shifts to work around class schedules and provide spot bonuses to cover medical expenses. For that generosity, the team was fiercely loyal to Mama Knot. Now, we have two ladies here that you wanted to introduce us to. Well, yes. Lila and Betty, mm -hmm. they're newcomers here to the farm. Betty has only been here 45 years, and Lila is really new. She's only been here 15. Oh, you are the newcomer, <laughs> only 15 years. You've been working here in the restaurant for 45 and years? I have worked. I haven't just been here. I have worked. Of course, yeah. <laughs> now, you worked with Mrs. Knott when she was making her famous chicken and her famous pies and all of that. Right. What was it like working for this lady? Ah, uh, let's see. She was, uh, she was tough. She was fair, though. That was the one thing about her. She was a very fair person to work mm -hmm. for. I loved every minute of it. I am the kitchen supervisor now, and I like to think that I have patterned myself after her seeing that these dinners are put out uh, like she would have liked them. To celebrate their employer's 50th wedding anniversary, the staff pulled resources and gifted the couple a pair of golden rain trees. Golden trees for Walter and Cordelia's golden anniversary. Cordy and her husband became millionaires, but judging by their lifestyle, you'd never know it. They shared a lifelong devotion to rose farming and occasionally took lessons in rose cultivation together. The happy couple often spirited away to meet and tend the many varieties grown in their nearby bed. Though the farm demanded constant attention, Walter and Cordelia always ate supper in the family dining room at 5pm. Even after a long day in the busy restaurant kitchen, Cordy would prepare the family meal herself at home. At the strike of five, Walter was in his seat, glad to be with his beautiful bride, and after the meal, he did the dishes. Not much change at Mrs. Knott's chicken dinner restaurant after 1960. There was one alteration, however, that has polarized the most seasoned fans. And this is our Pro Pack machine. This is our unique way that we cook chicken. This Pro Pack machine was built in the 1980s by a German engineer company that doesn't even exist anymore. Um, so basically how it works, you can flour up some of the chicken, and we place the chicken in each of these slots, okay? The larger ones are for the breast and thighs, and the smaller ones are for the legs and the wings. We cook the temp uh, chicken at two different temperatures. So it gets a pre-cooked temperature, it goes down, it comes back up, drains the oil off, goes back down again, and then comes back up and drains it off again. I go through about a million pounds of chicken a year. Whoa! <laughs> so, in an average day, we'll cook about 3,500 pieces of chicken. That's an average. In 2016, the 82-year-old establishment received a well-deserved renovation. Look at some of these drawings. This will show you the floor plan. As you enter now, you'll be entering through here, which is the new lobby. The dining kitchen with the pot valley stove. The uh, front dining room still the same. The bar is new this year. Just imagine you're sitting here on a nice summer day with a cool breeze coming down. One thing that we're not changing is the chicken dinner itself. Cordelia was never found looking at a cookbook. According to her youngest daughter, she just knew what to do, how to combine things to make them taste good. Tens of millions of satisfied diners prove this to be true. She certainly made Pomona proud. Mrs. Knott's chicken dinner restaurant was an unexpected breakthrough. More popular than ever, the eatery remains as much a draw to visitors as the neighboring theme park it spawned. It carries forward a legacy of hospitality and a taste of history. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Expedition Knott's Berry Farm and a look at the restaurant that started it all. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe and make sure to click the bell icon to be notified when new expeditions are released. Thank you to the Orange County Archives for assistance with footage and images. A big thank you as always to our amazing Patreons. You truly do make these expeditions possible. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram to find out about upcoming expeditions and we will see you next time.